Thank you, Tara. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you, Lynn. Thanks for inviting us into this amazing exhibit. Oh, so our pleasure, believe me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, even though that you can't see them, my colleagues, Amy Kurtz Landing and Mel Scalzi are in the background and they were absolutely uh, instrumental in, in making this exhibition happen. So uh, great, great thanks to uh, everybody at the Florence Griswold for, for making this exhibition happen. Uh, so this exhibition is about women's textile arts in New London County between 1750 and 1825. And the subject has been in the back of my head for at least 20 years because in my work as a freelancer, I just kept on running into these amazing textiles, just so many. And, and they, you know, just time after time after time, and they were from New London County. I'm like, what's going on here? And, and actually um, the working title of, of this show was called uh, Something in the Water because that was my way of describing, you know, how is it that all these interesting things were coming out of this one region? So let me tell you where New London County is because probably a lot of people watching don't know. New London County is the southeastern corner of Connecticut. And so its southern border runs along Long Island Sound. The eastern border is against Rhode Island. And on the western border, the town of Old Lyme, which is where we are now, is at the mouth of the Connecticut River, which runs up the center of the state. Um, but then the rest of, after Lyme, the rest of the county line veers off to the right. And so it, it's an economy very much tied to the sea um, with a, a very strong maritime uh, trade, boat building, trading, um, and in the 19th century, whaling was huge. And one of the things I wanted to do with this exhibition was to show that New London County was its own regional distinctive culture, because so often these textiles, especially the bed drugs, when we get into them, when they're written about in the, in the literature, they're identified as Connecticut River Valley. And New London County is not the Connecticut River Valley, okay? It's its own area. So that was one of the goals of this exhibition. Um, through, the exhibition is broken up in, there's three galleries. The first gallery is dedicated to the mid 18th century quilted petticoats that were kind of the start of all this. The second gallery is bed rugs, and the third gallery goes into the early 19th century with uh, white work and applique quilts of the very beginning of the 19th century. So we'll, we'll move chronologically. But back to New London County. Uh, New London County was quite prosperous uh, in the 18th and early 19th century. It had, as I said, this strong maritime uh, focus, but also quite prosperous farming uh, in the inland areas. They particularly specialized in raising beef cattle. And something that we really have to keep in mind is that this prosperity created a region that had the highest rate of enslavement in Connecticut. And so another thing that I want to bring to people's attention to think about as they look at these things is what's called the hidden labor behind these pieces, the various ways, not just enslaved uh, helpers, but hired help, um, shared help, uh, what they call trading works, all is happening in the background of these pieces that allowed these women the time to create these goods. And so we start out with this image of Prudence Punderson's embroidery. This is probably the most famous embroidery in America. It is, it's been published over and over and over again. It's called the first, second, and last scene of mortality. And 
This is actually the, the home of, of Prudence Penderson. Um, she was a young woman before she was married when, when she embroidered this, but like that, that, um, that table and the inkwell on it are actually in the collection of the Connecticut Historical Society as well as the embroidery. So this is a very factual image. And on the right, you see an African-American undoubtedly enslaved uh, nursemaid tending the baby. And so this is both a New London County embroidery, one of um, several Punderson pieces that you'll see in this exhibition, but it's also a great way to introduce this idea of hidden labor behind all of these pieces. So this first section is dedicated to the mid 18th century quilted petticoats. I'll direct you, no, let's go here first. First, I just want, I just want everybody to understand that when you're looking at these fabulous petticoats with this incredible in intricate detail, um, that these were not hidden in the 18th century. They were intended to be seen under the open fronted skirts of the 18th century. Um, they could also be worn as, as a skirt underneath a shorter gown, what would be called a bed gown, a short gown, a jacket, all these various ways that the, the quilted petticoat would be seen. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that these were imported from England, ready-made by the thousands. And so you didn't have to make your own here, but quilted petticoats were so common that in the 18th century, they were just called quilts. Mm. I did a, a whole bunch of diary research for a, a previous project. And I can tell you that in the 18th century, women were quilting three petticoats for every bed quilt. Uh, according to my diary research, bed quilts were much less common, much less common. So when you see quilt in a period record, they're talking about these skirts. Petticoats. These, I these have a quilts. question. Mm -hmm. Now, if would the women who made their own have been women without um, quite the wealth that other women had? Um, do you see any delineation there in which women were wearing imported ones and which were making their own? No, not at all. Um, in fact, uh, wealthy women uh, absolutely, definitely were stitching their own quilted petticoats. And Marla Miller, who's going to be one of the speakers for us, has done a wonderful study on how the cooperative labor of quilting these petticoats was a really important way of making connections in community and uh, even creating um, um, engagements. Uh, between, yeah, you know, like my son would really yeah. like your daughter, you know, and, yeah. and this sort of interaction over the quilting frame was very important. And that was happening at the upper levels where, where um, what, you know, as, as I was saying, we're near the Connecticut River um, and these prominent families were called the river gods. Oh. Uh, or in, in Connecticut, they were called the standing order. And so these are the families that are making these connections over the quilting frame to keep their power um, concentrated in, in, their, in their group, okay? Yeah. So, so anybody could be quilting their own petticoat um, or buying it. They could even buy it secondhand. So, you know, lots of ways of, of acquiring one. Okay. Okay, Thanks. so... Let's look at this red one. This petticoat was my first. This is from the Connecticut Historical Society. And I also wanna give a shout out to the Connecticut Historical Society, which owns something from every group that we're talking about here. Uh, they were absolutely crucial to the success of this exhibition. And I have been going back and forth there as either a staff member or a consultant or a researcher for almost 40 years. So I know their costume and textile collection quite well. And uh, after um, my stint as a curator at Old Sturbridge Village, 
I had a job at the Connecticut Historical Society as a, the costume specialist under an NEH grant. And I became re-familiarized with this wonderful petticoat made by Sarah Halsey. Uh, and it is quilted, and you'll probably get some details of this, yeah. but there's a lion here with the date 1758. And, and there are these three part um, uh, floral designs. You can see them in the drawing. All of these have drawings with them. Oh, you can't see it because the, it's not tipped quite right. But anyway, all of these quilts have drawings of the quilting designs done by Linda Baumgarten, uh, now retired curator of textiles at Colonial Williamsburg, who is also very interested in these petticoats. But anyway, so, and then over here on this side, here you can see a mermaid. And that just intrigued me so much. I started looking into these petticoats and I found a number, um, which I can talk about in a minute, but, but I also want to point out that Tandy Hirsch was the first person to write about these petticoats in an article in Jeanette Lazansky's um, Stitched by Mother, one of the Pennsylvania, early Pennsylvania quilt books. Uh, and so that was one place that I found information on this. And then because I'm a freelancer, I just kept on running into them. You know, I ran into them when I did a quilt exhibit at Historic Deerfield. They have another one, which we can show you in a minute. And then I ran into this one again when I was at the Connecticut Historical Society. This one, which is Ooh. actually a, a petticoat that after it went out of fashion to wear underneath the full 18th century gowns, was cut up and made into a bed spread, in, into a bed quilt, which happened a lot to these quilted petticoats. So anyway, the, the fancy quilted part runs along the bottom and then along the right side of this one. So this uh, was brought to the Connecticut Historical Society when I was there. And so I was like, oh, there's another one of those petticoats. And um, they didn't end up acquiring it, but it went to the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I ran into it again when I was doing another project. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm glad I know where it went. So anyway, I just kept on running into these. And I felt that these were coming out of a school. I don't know, it was just kind of this instinctive gut feeling that there were so many of these. We now know there are 19 that we know of. Mm -hmm. And um, they had such strong similarities. And if we knew who made it and how old they were, they were, like a teenager, which I don't know, it just all said to me, school. And so if we flip around, we talk, look up at this one. When I was at the uh, Wadsworth Athenaeum as acting curator, I ran into another one of these, but it, it's one that has been chopped up into fragments to hand out as relics to descendants. Okay, so when I looked up the documentation on that one, it turned out that there was another chunk at the Yale University Art Gallery, and that, that is this one. So this was my Rosetta Stone. This is the one that led me to attributing these, these petticoats to a school. So that was one of the big discoveries of this exhibition. And what happened was the, the fragment that's at the Wadsworth Athenaeum was uh, um, said to have been made by, I um, can't remember her name. Anyway, she was the wife of the governor of Connecticut. So she was a Trumbull. Um, and then this one at Yale was said to have been made by Mary Fish. Okay, so it can't be both. Right. So, um, so I looked into the genealogies and all that sort of stuff. And both women were the great grandmothers of the woman who gave this one to Yale. The one from the Wadsworth was actually from one more um, removal, not directly from this woman. And you can understand why they would want to attribute it to the 
wife of the governor because you know she would be much more prominent at the time. But when I did the genealogy, she was really too young. I think she was too young. So I, I, I really feel that Mary Fish is the appropriate attribution for this piece. Well, that was great for me because we know who Mary Fish is. She's very well known. There's a book written about her called The Way of Duty because her family left so much documentation. And I looked into that book because it was sitting on my shelf because I've been working in Connecticut for so long, I knew about her. And, and um, there it said, she went to the school of Sarah Osborne in Newport, Rhode Island. She started going there at the age of 15. And I'm like, okay, here we've got the name of a school. So then I go to my other bookshelf on the other side of my office and I pull out my sampler books, uh, including the work of uh, the late sampler scholar, Betty Ring, who's written you know, the, the master work, the encyclopedia of American samplers. And I look up Sarah Osborne, she's in Newport and everything just fell into place. You look at the samplers that are attributed to her school and they have the same motifs that we see in the petticoats. Um, and we have one uh, over here, if we want to, yeah, if we want to, Turn over here. This is fascinating, Lynn. How exciting for you too. Well, I that moment. I know. I know. I boy. I <laughs> I squealed very loud. <laughs> I bet you did. I would have. So we have here uh, one of the samplers that is believed to have come from the Sarah Osborne School that's now at the American Museum in Bath, England. But there are some more out there. But these are what Betty Ring called the frolicking people samplers uh, because they have human figures in them. And you see similar designs in many of these petticoats of, and I don't know if you can see over there, but, but this, these two um, chunks, again, cut up as relics uh, from the Colonial Williamsburg collection show um, a woman with a fan and a man in a cocked hat, similar to the designs we see here. Also in these samplers, we see the critters, the same sort of animals, the stags and the dogs and that sort of thing that we see in the petticoats. And we also see not in this one, but in others, um, there are samplers that have like a big flower right in the middle of it. And we see those in the petticoats. So, so at this point, we have two points of circumstantial evidence. We, we know that one of the petticoat makers went to the school and then the motifs are very similar from the samplers to the petticoats. And then a number of the petticoats are worked with a date. And all of those dates fall within the period that Sarah Osborne was working in Newport. Oh. Oh, Lynn. <laughs> so no smoking gun, but, but um, three pretty good points of circumstantial evidence. Yeah. So that was very exciting. Another thing that I want to talk about is how distinctively regional this stuff is. Um, a couple of points. Back to the idea of differentiating New London County from the Connecticut River Valley. This is another really great point of evidence that shows the connection between New London County and Newport, Rhode Island, um, which of course they would share this maritime um, trade and all kinds of business re relationships and, and family relationships. So that's, that's um, a point of ongoing research that I'm working on. But another thing I wanted, um, I was looking at uh, you know, spreading my net very wide is looking at furniture in Newport County because furniture tends to be much better documented by historians and material, material culturalists. Because it's made by men. Because it, it's a man, because it's a guy thing, you know? Um, so there's this group of furniture called the Stonington Group. Stonington is New London County. And the scholars who have worked on that group tie its influence to Newport, okay? So that's another, bit of evidence. Um, 
So the reason I want you to look in this direction is because these valances, which are from the Williams family in New London County, and these are in the collection of the of Mystic Seaport, the designs of the flowers in these, and we can get you some details, are very similar to the little three-part floral designs that we see in the petticoats. So this is another thing I'm trying to figure out is, you know, what is the connection between the petticoats and the New London County cruel work from the same period? Because right. New London County cruel work is very regional. You can look at it and say, that's New London County. Well, you, know? you can, I couldn't, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that's really distinctive about it are these, it, it's called, um, they call it like the symmetrical flower group, you know, and so this is one of the distinctive features of New London County that um, really identify it. And, okay, so here is here's another one of these petticoats that was made into a bed quilt, but instead of using it for the drops, they made the whole center out of it by cutting the petticoat in half and then sewing it together hem edge to hem edge. Brilliant. So that, yeah, so the bottom half is actually upside down, but the top half is right side up. Um, but if, I hope you can see in, in Linda's drawings here, these vine motifs and the way the leaves are done, that is another very distinctive Connecticut cruel work feature, which we see in Valances in Gallery 2. Yeah. So, so I'm well, just looking at the intersection of these different textile arts and, and thinking about the influences and where they're coming from. And could Prudence Gear be the student who quilted her initials PG in this bed quilt? Mm -hmm. But we have no way of knowing, right? Mm -hmm. um, Would it have been uh, standard or typical for these young ladies in the school to learn all these different uh, needle works like cruel at the same time. So they may be doing the same motifs in different types of needlework. They certainly could be. Sarah Osborne did leave one, um, place one ad in the Newport newspaper and she advertised all the different um, skills that she taught. Um, she just said embroidery. She didn't say what kind of embroidery and, and, you know, my smoking gun would be if she had said quilting, but she did not. She just said, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know that some of these girls schools taught quilting uh, because an ad that I found in the Boston newspaper uh, in the early 18th century offered quilting at a school. And also Linda Baumgarten, um, who will also be a speaker in our series, in addition to Marla. Um, she's gonna be talking about regionalism in these quilted petticoats. And she's done a lot of work on the school of Anne Marsh of Philadelphia and has discovered that Anne Marsh was the woman behind these um, distinctive quilted petticoats from Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania. And again, connecting them to a school. So it happened. Um, and so, yes, the girls who were doing these petticoats could have been doing the cruel work. Cruel work and... but, but, right, and, and Amy is reminding me to tell you about the back stitch. That is another very distinctive feature of these petticoats. Okay. That they are not, they're not stitched with, you know, your typical quilting running stitch. They're quilted with a spaced back stitch, um, which you, you think about it, I mean, that's twice as many stitches you have to put in there than you would if you were doing a running stitch. But it also offers the opportunity to create a very finely detailed design. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a very distinctive thing about these petticoats. Another way that you can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's from the Sarah Osborne group or whatever it is we end up calling these. 
oh, I can't wait to find out what you find out. I, well, I want to be a fly on the wall in that moment. Well, <laughs> fingers crossed I can find more. I mean, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Doing women's history like this is so difficult. Yeah. Because they left so few records. And Sarah Osborne, for someone who is incredibly well known, she's her diary. She left a diary. How unusual is that? And it's been published. Did she talk about teaching needlework? No. Nope. She talked about God and religion and these things that she was actually better known for in the period. She was a real, she was a religious leader in Newport. And that is where her fame comes from, not from this incredible school. She was the leading school in Newport in the mid 18th century. So again, you know, you'd think you have this terrific resource, but the, their focus at the time is not what we want now. Right. <laughs> at least yeah. Not I, what, <laughs> what I would like for them to have been focusing on. So the other thing about these is thinking about the historical context of these pieces, because we're looking at a good 75 years of, of not only New London, but American history and incredibly important American history. Absolutely. So these are done in the mid 18th century. What's happening in the middle of the 18th century on the North American continent, the French and Indian War, okay? So the battle for dominance between the English and the French of the North American continent. And so, of course, the colonists are going to be much more allied with the, with, with the English. And so you see the British Royal Coat of Arms. It's here somewhere. Or anyway. So, so, with, so with that having the English Coat of Arms, I, I was thinking of another question to ask you, too, is that if a lot of these were being imported per, from England, I'm presuming, right, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. then have you are you able to identify overlaps in the style or where the new london style launched from the english style and and did its own thing where do you these, these petticoats are really very different from the english quilted petticoats um and i'm gonna talk about the the design inspiration over here in this okay in this corner um the English petticoats are generally pretty readily identifiable um, because they, they, they just have their own distinctive quilting style. And, and they're often quilted, again, with the running stitch rather than the back stitch, okay. quilted a bit more hastily. Oh, so mass fewer, production. Fewer stitches per inch. Right. Um, can be one identifying factor. I mean, there's always exceptions, but right. um, the, it, it's an interesting question because in general, the English quilted petticoats are pretty different from the American, at least what I see in New England, I guess is what I should be saying. They're different from what I see in New England. Okay. Um, but the bed quilts that are also being imported from England have a, a, an important um, design inspiration for the earliest New England whole cloth bed quilts. Okay. But that's, that's, another, that's another topic, another interview, okay? It's another rabbit hole, right? Yep, yep. yep. Okay, so um, let's go over to the corner here. Okay, so this, this marvelous yellow uh, petticoat is from the DAR Museum in Washington, DC. And it has a mermaid and a fully rigged sailing ship. Do you see the ship? Isn't that yes. great? Yes. Oh my gosh. And it's got a, a pear tree. This pear tree shows up every once in a while. In fact, it was in that gold colored um, bed quilt that I just showed you. And then... Um, or were we... pears a big thing in Connecticut? Not in Connecticut, but we're... I'll show you in just a minute. Okay, all right. I'm getting ahead of it, aren't I? Well, I don't know, okay. just FYI. Here's one of those with the really distinctive um, big center flower 
that I talked about showing up in the Sarah Osborne schools every once in a while. Oh, yeah, I see it. I see yes, it. Yes. It came in clear. Yeah. yeah. Right. Actually, okay. So we've got another one in this gold petticoat that you can see maybe better. Um, but it's another feature also in uh, the Prudence Punderson cruel work valances that are in the next gallery. Thank you. Now, this piece behind you, in order to make that a flat piece instead of, I would imagine, a, a circle at the top for the petticoat, when they laid it out, did, it, did they? patch the top to make it flat or they just it... they they just took it off the waistband okay all right so it would have been and, and, and cut it and cut it up you know one yeah. one side to lay it flat okay um this this is a great one to point out this example came from los angeles from the los angeles county museum of art so yeah. there's a, a couple of points i would make here is how far some of these things have dispersed and just thinking about the museums that we pulled from to get these things, the Met, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the American Folk Art Museum, the Henry Ford Museum, and there's more of these new London County textiles that are like in the MFA Boston, who wanted desperately to lend, but they couldn't because they had their own show going. Um, the Chicago Art Institute, the Dallas Fine Arts Museum. I think it's a real, it's, it's um, a great, um, it, it's great evidence of the excellence of the new London County needlework that these pieces have gone all over the country into some of the, the nation's most prestigious collections. Absolutely. I mean, what other county can say that? I, I don't know of it. Yeah, I, that's phenomenal. So, but then also kudos to Mel and the staff here at the Flow Grizz for pulling all these things together. This was an incredibly complicated exhibition. Um, the most you've ever done, right, Mel? Yeah, by myself. Yep, yep. Um, well, thank you, Mel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of those oh. flowers that you can... See right there. This is one that I ran into when I was um, doing a quilt exhibition as a freelancer for Historic Deerfield. And again, I run into another one of these these quilted petticoats. I'm like, there's They're another one. You. They're finding so I you. On, I keep on finding them. Uh, Linda Baumgarten, who had several in the in the CW collection, the Colonial Williamsburg collection. You know, she started looking. She came up with a whole bunch. Um, and, and so, you know, we were sharing things back and forth whenever I'd find one and go, Linda, do you know what this one is? And, um, and so again, um, it's her drawings in here. Uh, right. And so uh, I, again, I'm so appreciative of the collaboration of my friends and colleagues out there in the field. What's really fun about this one is that it's little distinctive character. I don't know if we can see it, is a, is a winged Cupid drawing his bow and arrow. Oh. And uh, there's a, a quilted petticoat in the collection of the University of Rhode Island textile department that's not in this exhibition, but it has the exact same Cupid. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah. It, it, quick question too. It looks like it has stuff work in it. It does it? Or no. It, mm -mm. It's just so dense. No, it's just it's quilted just a, in the background. Right, to make the design pop. If yeah. you don't do that, um, diagonal stitching or some kind of stitching in the background, the design just kind of disappears. Yeah. Um, Exquisite. Since we're talking about batting, the other thing that's interesting in these, um, because a number of them have worn spots, as you might expect, the batting is dyed to match the face fabric. You're kidding. No, no. So like the yellow is yellow, which you can see in the, in the DAR, the blue is blue, green is green, whatever. So that the batting is dyed. So that as they wear, they'll still look. Right. It, it doesn't look so bad. Yeah. 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 The really? other interesting thing, which I can't show you is that, you know, we've got these expensive imported high end textiles on the outside. I mean, this one's silk. Uh, a, a number of these are, are Kalamanko wool, which is that high-end worsted with the satin weave and the glazing and all that sort of stuff. But then on the other side, they're like 
piece of these very domestic, you know, stripes and wanted to give you a, a better shot of the, the valances, the valances. So you can see that um, symmetrical flower uh, design that shows up on, on the petticoats as well. And just that beautiful, uh, that beautiful cruel work embroidery. I, I, I adore cruel work. It is, it is stunning. Is that a thistle in the top left? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. Did you have any Scots <laughs> in the area? <laughs> I don't think it was a significant um, population. Okay. Oh, Amy's pointing out that thistles appear on a painted chest from Saybrook. Okay. Well, yep. Okay. So we'll add that one to a little vault. <laughs> um, just a little tidbit, you know, about how distinctive these are that I started digging into cruel work and pulling out all that I had on my bookshelves. And I found uh, a, a book by Ann Pollard Rowe that was published in like the 1950s. And it showed a cruel work bed cover that was identified as Boston. And I saw that and I was like, that's not Boston, that's New London County. And it's I in love the that, first of all, I mean, I just have to say, I love that you could know that just by looking at the picture. That's so <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Beyond. I've, seen, I've seen quite a lot of this yeah, stuff and so yeah. uh, anyway and so it's it's now in the collection of the Met and so then I went to Amelia Peck's book about their bed cover collection and sure enough she had done the research and she's from New London County there it was is. not Boston there it, it was is. New London County there yes. it is yes okay yes. so let's so I also have a corner here uh, devoted to the inspiration for these designs. The designs for these critters and, and plants and stuff are coming out of 17th century published bestiaries and herbals that regularly served as embroidery pattern books. And so we have, you know, there's a unicorn and we've got several examples of unicorns on these petticoats and it looks just like that and there's bunnies and camels and lions and you know all these things that we're seeing in the petticoats are coming out of these 17th century bestiaries um, and so then similarly we see how these designs appear in 17th century needlework and here we have the stag which is just what we see look it's a pear tree it's a pear tree <laughs> <laughs> Just like we see in a couple of the petticoats, we have the people, they're not exactly frolicking, but they are, you know, the, the same sort of idea. Uh, we've got a pond with fish, which is exactly what we see in that petticoat over there in the corner. So again, there's these shared designs that are coming out of the British tradition yeah. of embroidery. Um, and this is what's called stump work. It's not the period term, but it's this raised uh, padded embroidery that's very three-dimensional oh. and uh, again uh, grateful to the lender this is from a private collection uh, a private collector who when we were turned down for one that I wanted I called up and she said oh sure you can have it oh. <laughs> so, bless her heart thank you, thank you private yeah. collector. Yeah. is yeah. that uh what are the figures in that doing oh they're just kind of hanging around <laughs> um, she she's she's holding a uh, strawberries she's holding strawberries in her hand um he's petting a dog it looks like or reaching out to pet a dog um these are the children um she's just holding a bunch of flowers and the man is just standing there looking decorative the, well <laughs> finally the men gets to the man gets to stand and look decorative instead of the woman right um well look at i mean they even um, they even portrayed all the, the ribbon, the loops of ribbon that were very wow. uh, fashionable over the boot tops and the period and everything. It, Do we it, know anything right. about the, the significance of the pear tree? If we, if you, we keep seeing it there. Um, the, 
from what I understand, looking at the research on 17th century embroidery by Margaret Swain, it's called Figures on Fabric is the book. And she says that these are just designs. They had no particular symbolic meaning. Okay. Um, the book about the Hardwick textiles though, about Bess of Hardwick and, um, and, and recent in, uh, interpretations of Mary Queen of Scots in those cases suggest some symbolism. Mm -hmm. But I think on these kind of everyday sort of, I have to make this piece for school <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, works. Um, the, the symbolism isn't the important thing. It's okay. The design. Got you. Yep. That makes sense. Okay. Gallery two. These, I am fascinated with these bed rugs, Lynn. Aren't these, aren't these cool? See, and yeah. this is a thing that um, a lot of people aren't familiar with, with bed rugs. Uh, do you want to bring it in a little closer, Amy? Uh, Mel? Yeah, there we go. That's great. Yeah, thank you. So bed rugs were the most common type of bed cover in colonial America, no matter what part of the country you were in, north or south. Most of them, again, like those quilted petticoats, they were imported ready-made from England, where they were woven uh, with a supplementary weft loop. So some, a supplementary weft, the crosswise threads was pulled up in a loop. And so you end up with this really shaggy surface. And this is where we get snug as a bug in a rug. So they're wow. talking about bed bugs in the bed rugs, okay? Yes. So in New England, those women who chose to make their own bed rugs rather than buying them imported ready-made, embroidered their bed rugs instead of weaving them. In the Southern United States, domestic bed rugs were woven, but up here they were embroidered. And the defining feature of a, of a bed rug is that the entire surface is embroidered. It's not just the design, it's the background too. You don't see any fabric in these, the entire surface is covered with embroidery stitches. Wow. Is it yeah. any? Is it in any way similar to what we know of today as um, needle punch embroidery? No, no, no. Um, and they they've been um, confused with hook drugs yeah. forever. Okay. okay, but it it's it's a needle and yarn technique. So uh, you have a bunch of yarn, you know, not just one, but like six or seven or whatever. Uh, yarns in your needle and you're working them one of several ways. You can do a flat uh, running stitch or a flat back stitch. I'm going to touch this one. <laughs> okay, well, okay. This one, this one is a, a, a flat kind of a random stitch. And you can see, can you see in the background yeah. how you have this dotted effect? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it was hooked, you'd be going in and out of the same hole because you're right. pulling, it, pulling it up. And so that's how you can tell a hooked piece from a needle uh, embroidered uh, bed rug. Okay. So this one has a flat surface. Um, a number of them I can show you. It, it's, it's, it's relatively flat anyway. Some of them have a little higher loop as they do their um, running stitch. And then like those ones are a little higher. Would that um, be based on their skill level or just the design? I think it's of, just, or it's, just their it's style. A personal preference. Personal preference, okay. Um, and then others, which we'll get to next after I talk about this one, um, others, are done in a darning stitch. Uh, so, and that one's flat and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay. Okay, so to put these in context, I did an inventory of every known American embroidered bed rug and I found 63, which is like 20 more than were known before. So that was pretty cool. 
um, or that have been significantly published. Um, and then I looked at, I, I broke them into design groups and I found that like more than half of them came from Connecticut. <laughs> and then when I broke that down further, most of those came from New London County. Wow. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so this was my, this is my thesis in this uh, section is that the, the tradition of doing these bed rugs is being passed down through families and in a very localized manner. Okay, so this is one of the earliest. It's not the earliest American embroidered bed rug. That would be the Mary Avery rug from like 1726 or something that's at the PBD Essex Museum. But this is the oldest one in Connecticut. Um, and again, it's New London County, 1741. This uh, Phoebe Dennison Billings, okay, um, and she. This is Ebenezer Phoebe Billings, okay. Doing the the genealogy on these, I kept on finding the same names popping up over and over and over again. So Dennison is one of those names that's connected all over uh, amidst these pieces. Um, and it connects to other families with different surnames. So uh, it's, there's gonna be a massive family tree in our publication oh, <laughs> next yeah. year. Oh, that's uh, exciting. Yeah, so interestingly, there's pretty good records of this family. In fact, there's the Denison Family Homestead in um, New London County. And we know, for, for example, this was a slave owning family. Okay, this is one that we can say, you know, like the Pendersons, because we've got visual evidence there, there's documentary evidence, this was another slave owning family. So um, let's go over here. Sure. I did say um, for, for the, the Phoebe bed rug there too, with its center medallion design, that's coming straight out of the imported whole cloth bed quilts. Right, very English style. Very English style, okay. Yeah. But you do get that big center flower. Yes. So, okay, so, um, so then we come to the most significant group of, of bed rugs, certainly by number. And this is what I call the pot of flowers with reverse curved vine, something like that. Okay. That's extraordinary. There are 16 bed rugs in this design. Four of them are in this kind of blue and white or blue, brown and white colorway that are uh, darned. They're, they're done in decorative darning stitches to create different patterns, different filling stitches within all the motifs. Ooh. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, so there's four like this, and then there's 12 that I'll show you next that are earth tone colors. And the thing that's really interesting about these is that they come out of three towns, just three towns in New London County. They all come out of the Northwest corner of New London County. They come out of Colchester, Lebanon, and Basra. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. Very this cool. one. Who knows, another one of my working theories, but again, I have no proof, just a little bit of circumstantial evidence. This is like the grandmother of all these bed rugs. This one was made by Elizabeth Foote of Colchester. Uh, she is quite well documented. Her initials EF are up there at the top. She left her diary, a short diary, but it's something anyway, that is in the collection of the Connecticut Historical Society. The interesting thing, if we wanna come over here, is that all four of these bed rugs in this style, and here's one from um, the collection of historic Deerfield. And then she did her whole name, Mary Foote, AD 1778. This one is at Winterthur. So there are four of these. One of them is, is in private hands and we have a photograph of it here. We, we don't have it in the exhibit. Um, 
all four of these seem to be connected to one wedding that happened in Colchester in 1778, that four couples were married in one ceremony in Colchester. And the, the Foot sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, um, so we've got two Foot sisters and their brother, and then two, anyway, the Foots married the Otises, okay? So, and then there's also a Huntington mixed in there. But anyway, for the most part, it's this intermingling of families. Right. And the foot name comes up over and over and over and over in, in the bed rugs and in the later, uh, the early 19th century quilts that, that we might have time to talk about, we'll see. But the interesting thing about Elizabeth is that we know from her diary that she was drawing quilt patterns for neighbors okay oh yes and these are the earliest bedrugs of this design is she the grandmother of the design i would love to say so and and there are these little intriguing bits because she married the minister of lebanon in this ceremony okay and those four or th those that other colorway the other 12 bed rugs are all from Lebanon or Basra. These four are from, are from Colchester. The rest of them are from Lebanon and Basra. Elizabeth from Colchester marries the minister of Lebanon. Up oh, there, yep. His mother is a Metcalf. <laughs> and the Metcalf family is connected to a whole bunch of those bed rugs. Yeah. So was Elizabeth inspiring the bed rugs? over there the problem is is that once she married uh the reverend huntington they moved to marlboro not lebanon which is on the other side of colchester it's nearby but you know it's another one we'll probably never know but it's fun to speculate mm -hmm. okay so the thing that's really cool about these let's you can see the different filling stitches that are created yes. by, the, by the darning patterns. Yes. Okay, this is, this is inspired by seven, 16th and 17th century black work embroidery, which was used as a design source for all kinds of things, including, You may not be able to see it. This is a uh, lining paper in the, inside of this box. This is a document box. This is the document box that brought the uh, Plymouth, Char Plymouth Colony Charter over from England. I mean, how cool is that? Doesn't it make oh. you just weak in the knee? And it's lined with this paper that looks like these designs, okay? Um, and I don't know, you probably, Did maybe you we can give you that. A, a, a well, I didn't even find, well, it was, the person who started the whole um, research on bedrugs was William Warren, who was a curator um, who kind of floated around from, you know, the Connecticut Historical Society and the Wadsworth Athenaeum and that sort of stuff. He did a bedrug exhibition 50 years ago. These have not been all pulled together and thought of again in an exhibition for 50 years, since, since 1972. He included this box. So I owe William Warren um, for knowing about this. The problem is it either changed hands or he published the wrong owner in the catalog. And so I am indebted to Amy who tracked it down to the actual owner, which is well done, um, Amy. the... the <laughs> the pilgrim pilgrim hall museum okay so yeah boy my my heart just dropped when when she wrote me a note and said you know the the organization that was supposed to have the box said they don't have the box i'm like oh no where's the box gone <laughs> and we'll the pictures. yeah yeah so again i just wanted to show this overlapping of design from one form of textile to another. Here are the valances 
that were problem, they're attributed to Prudence Gear Punderson, who was the mother of the Prudence Punderson Rossiter, who did that embroidery at the very beginning with the, the three stages of mortality and the black slave and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So this is Prudence Gear Punderson. And I just want you to see those filling stitches that appear in the cruel work. This is a distinctive Connecticut feature, the filling stitches here. And it is exactly what we were looking at in the vines of that quilted petticoat um, bed quilt in the previous gallery. It's exactly what oh, we were Oh, I just got goosebumps, Len. Oh, I know. I get goosebumps through this whole thing. Okay. Oh, it's so good. And so in this display case, we have other examples because one of my arguments is that a lot of these designs are coming out of lace pattern books of the 17th century. And so here we have a book from the Met of a lace pattern with a design of the pot of flowers with, you know, just, just sorry, I keep on bumping the label. Um, so it's a, it's a design very much like what we're seeing here. And these are all actually drawing from the archeological excavations of ancient Roman sites that happened like Pompeii and Herculaneum that happened in the 17th century. If you look at the mosaics and the wall paintings and all that sort of thing from these archeological sites, it's these designs, it's the double handled urn and the, and the crazy flowers and the curly cues, the, these reverse curved vines and such. So these designs go way, way, way back. Oh. Um, and then I also have a ceramic plate. The women are, they're surrounded by these designs. Yeah. There's a ceramic plate here with that same sort of filling design. And, and the edge of it is what we're gonna see in a bed rug over there. So these designs even appear in gravestones. They appear in silver. They appear in their imported printed textiles. Um, so these influences are coming from all over. And then there's a, a beautiful set of uh, Gross Point 17th century lace cuffs that again, show those filling stitches, show the crazy flowers. You know, what, what strikes me too, Lynn, is these, a bed rug would have taken an extraordinary amount of time. Well, that's what everybody asks. And I wish I could answer that perfectly. There, um, a woman I knew in 1983, when I first got married and moved to Connecticut, I had the great fortune of being introduced to a woman named Jessie Marshall, who was the, the grand dame of New England textiles at the time, especially Connecticut. And I went to her and she taught me how to spin and to weave. Um, and she made a reproduction bed rug in the 1970s. And it took her three years to do it. But you know, a woman's life in the 20th century is very different from a woman's life in the 18th century. I mean, think about this with those four bed rugs from the Foot family that are attributed to that one wedding ceremony, okay? The, that's the impetus for making these bed rugs. They weren't gonna know that they were engaged for, I mean, that they were gonna get married in three years. I mean, it would be a much shorter time span. Yeah. Um, and the other thing from my diary research, uh, looking at women's quilting and such, they were so fast. I mean, they were doing this all the time. They were so proficient. They were so expert. They were incredibly fast. They had to. And so I think we just have to keep that in mind um, yeah. uh, regarding these bed rugs. Yeah. And all of them. Fair point. Yeah. So when I was talking about that other colorway of mm -hmm. this design group, this is the exact same design that we saw in those blue and white darning uh, yeah. stitch bed rugs. But it has a completely different effect because it's worked in different colors and it's worked with that looped looped um, running stitch. And sometimes these, are, um, these can even be cut. I think maybe that one looks like it's cut. So you've got this real shaggy appearance. I mean, um, okay, so here we have 
Felina Metcalf, right? Felina McCall, McCall, Felina McCall, it's another M. Um, and again, she is connected to a whole bunch of these other families that these bedrocks show up in and she's from Lebanon, okay? And um, I don't know if you wanna just kind of spin around, okay, here. What's, oh, the other interesting thing you know, some of these have still retained some documentation and a bunch of them don't. But one of the things that I did in the process of all this research is putting these together in design groups and then noticing, hmm, four of these that look so much alike have an L as the letter of the last name. You know, some of them are documented. Okay, so I looked them up in their genealogies and yeah, they make sense. The two that we know, okay, they're sisters. Well, what's this E-L? E-L. They had a sister named Eunice. <laughs> okay, so yeah. probably Eunice. Yeah. And then there was another family member who was named... Abigail, and yes, this is NL, but most Abigails in the 18th century were actually called Nabby. Nabby. So could that be another sister, cousin, whatever? But these are all from the Lothrop, um, also spelled Lathrop family. So again, I think it's really important, these family connections, because when we know where these come from, they come from two towns yeah. in New London County. And when you look at the designs, the designs are exactly the same. So they're not gonna be real widespread. I think there was one person, probably one person who was drawing these in the community, but I don't know who that was yet. And the other thing to keep in mind is that they're at least somewhat faded now. If we need to dig down a little bit into the yarns and get down to the base, you can see how much brighter they were. Like some of these very soft sort of orangey or, you know, just tan colors were like coral and <gasps> pink. Yeah, and, and, and more vibrant greens. So this is another design group that is most likely New London County. Um, unfortunately, these ones are not as well documented as the pot of flowers, but one of them came down with a history that it was from Norwich uh, or New London, uh, which were the two like port towns of New London County. And we now know of four of these. Uh, interesting little tidbit is the latest one was found at a tag sale in California. And Julie, our friend Julie Silber, got it from a picker who found it at a tag sale. <laughs> and she brought it with, yeah, she brought it with her to an AQSG meeting for me to authenticate. And my jaw hit the floor. Uh, I was like, oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's a Norwich uh, bed rug. And so that one is now in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg. Wow. But so who knows? The, I mean, these might still be out there. I'd love for this exhibition to um, pull some more out of the woodwork, which would be really cool. Oh yeah. But what's so cool about these is uh, there's just all kinds of cool things about these. But <laughs> yeah, where to start? <laughs> that, yeah, that, that border of um, what in the punctuation world is called the curly bracket. That's a very Queen Anne line. It's exactly what we saw on the edge of that plate in the other room. And then this shaded, the shaded uh, embroidery, the, the shade, that ombre blue yeah. is exactly what we see in period uh, flame stitch embroidery, which is a canvas work technique. And we have a couple of pocket books there. And then the other thing about these is, you know, that scallop design. Yeah. You see that in both in patchwork quilts and in 
quilting patterns yeah in the early century so there are, again there are connections and then oh yeah yeah look at this one look at this one okay so if you can see up there what have we got we've got a pieced quilt pattern we've got the eight pointed star and what is that yeah. like a lemoine star yeah that's a lemoine star look at that yep, yep. okay um so again, you know, interesting overlap to yeah. other textiles. Absolutely. Uh, and then here are some of those flame, that flame stitch embroidery that I was talking about. These are a, a couple of uh, pocket books. These were carried by men in the 18th century. And this is another Punderson piece, probably done by uh, Prudence Gear Punderson for her husband. She was the maker of the balances that I'm agog about. You know, I'm seeing a, a resemblance to Art Deco, too. I wonder if that some of this, you know, how you just said a minute ago that everything experiences a revival. I wonder well, there, there's a kind of a necessary geometry to canvas work. Yeah. Okay. True. So maybe, maybe that's what you're thinking. Okay. So this is another group um, that had never been put together before. We've got a, a couple in this gallery that came out because of all these weird, you know, long-standing connections I've had with working in Connecticut. When I was at the Connecticut Historical Society, again, as a costume specialist, the, the piece that you see on the far wall uh, which we'll see better in a minute, uh, came in as a gift to the collection. And it is an applique bed cover dated 1808. It has the name of the maker in the town, Montville, um, as, along with a, a religious passage embroidered in black cross stitch uh, in banners. And it, it's just, it's a very distinctive piece. Um, that particular piece is appliqued with the three grapevines that appear on the Connecticut state flag. So it's a, a patriotic as well as uh, religious uh, emblems there. Okay, so fast forward 18, 19 years and Judy Groh posted on Facebook this one with the tree as a recent acquisition by the Hunterdon County Historical Society in New Jersey. And I was like, wow, that looks so much like the one at CHS. And it also is marked Montville. Well, there's a Montville, New Jersey. So this was before this exhibit was happening or anything. So it was another one of those things I just kind of filed away in the back of my head. And then, um, and then I was talking to Barbara Brackman about something. I can't remember exactly how it came up. And she had information on the Eagle one. So that's three. They're all cross-stitched in black. They're all dated between 1805 and 1808. They're all located in Montville. Okay. So I did the genealogy on them. They're all from the Bradford family, two sisters and their niece. So the one from Hunterdon County is actually from Montville, Connecticut, very clearly oh. not, not Montville, New Jersey. Here we have this family grouping of a, of a bed cover design that's very unusual, very unusual. Applique is not a big thing in New England. And, and these aren't like the other applique of the period where you cut out the designs from a chintz and applique them on. They are cut out from one fabric in, in a design or to create a design. It, it, it's very monochromatic, right? So it's one right. fabric or two fabrics maybe? Generally, this one has the brown, so it's, it's three, but the yeah. others are, are entirely just one fabric in addition yeah. to the white background. Right. And you can see the cross-stitched embroidery on here. Yeah. So as with these other ones, I didn't really talk about it with the bed rugs, but you know, the bed rugs are tied to the revolutionary period. 
These are tied to the early Republic, what, what's called the early Republic of uh, American history. And so this is the decade when uh, Britain is harassing American maritime trade. They are literally like kidnapping American sailors and impressing them into service for Great Britain. And this is damaging our, our trade and economy. And so to try and stop this, President Jefferson um, creates an embargo against Great Britain. And so that's the period of these bedrugs leading up to and then into the embargo, which then eventually leads to the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. And so the various and sundry mottos on here, um, while biblical, could also be interpreted in a patriotic way of, you know, in, in some way or another, especially, you know, you get the symbolism of the eagle. I think you see what's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. What's really going on here. Yeah. Um, so um, this one, um, let the arms of America be subjugated only to the banners of the cross. Okay. So that's not a biblical passage, but that's pretty clearly patriotic, but also in kind of a religious manner um and then it said and the sweet servitude of emmanuel his his yoke is easy and his burden light okay so um again uh patriotic and also religious and i don't can you can you pull up close the the applique skill of this is just exquisite they're just beautiful nice pointy um, yes. Uh, the saw teeth. There are things like these. These saw teeth appear on all of them. This I forgot to do it on this side, but this cross hatching appears on all three. Yeah. Um, the other interesting tidbit about these is that they're shaped like a bed rug with the rounded corners. Right. Instead of square, that which you usually see on a on a quilt. So. That Style continued. Isn't that great? And then, um, just real briefly, there's a fourth one that is a puzzle. The resemblance of this one to these three is undeniable, and it falls in the same date range, which is a very narrow time frame. It this is. one's in Kentucky or Tennessee. This one's what? in Tennessee. How did it get to Tennessee? Um, and it also has the black cross stitching, so unusual, but it is quilted and stuffed, unlike these ones, which are just one layer. So, and the applique technique is done with the buttonhole stitching instead of um, the kind of hidden stitch. So there are important differences, but where did this design come from? What, what is the inspiration and is it, this is a period when a lot of Connecticut people are moving west, they're moving north. Is there a family connection there that we don't know about anymore? Unfortunately, the name associated with this one, Rebecca Foster, is too common to pin down. Um, and this one is actually embroidered Nashville. But there are 40 different Nashvilles in America. Oh, which, cool. Which, yeah, which Nashville is it? Okay. Um, Mary Kay well, Vogel, who is the Tennessee Southern quilts expert, is not convinced this is actually Nashville, Tennessee. She thinks it's too early. Okay. But questions. Okay. Yeah. <gasps> so these, these are the quilts that started this whole exhibition because, again, I was working at the Connecticut Historical Society as a costume specialist, and somebody brought in one of these quilts with the polka dots in the background. Well, filed away in my memory from 20 years prior or whenever it was, I remembered coming to an exhibition here at the Florence Griswold and seeing one of these quilts with the polka dot background. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. That one's just like the one at the Flow Grizz. So then some years later in 2019, the Connecticut Historical Society gives me the opportunity to do a quilt exhibition for them. 
And I put that polka dot quilt out uh, in this exhibition. And Alden O'Brien of the DAR Museum gets wind of it. And she writes to me and she says, hey, I've got one of those in my collection too. And so there are three of these polka dot quilts. And because the one at CHS was on display behind glass, I couldn't get to it. So I said, Alden, draw the design on mylar for me so I can take it down to the flow grids and lay it on top of theirs and see how close the motifs are. So she did that. And so that is the meeting that I had here with Amy and Mel. And I started talking about all these amazing things that were coming out of New London County. And even, you know, they pull out the folder for their quilt and lo and behold, there's an article from the American Folk Art Museum about a polka dot quilt. It is exactly like, the, okay, so that's four. That's four of these quilts. But anyway, so like, I don't know, a month, month, two months later, Amy writes to me and she says, would you like to propose an exhibition on um, these early New England, um, these early New London textiles? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I think I, yeah, yeah, I think I'll do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how this all, yeah. So that's how this all started. But the interesting thing, and this is how so much of my knowledge has been gained is through pure luck and happenstance that um, Alden through a quilt symposium at the DAR Museum a few years ago and Hallie Bond was presenting her uh, information about Adirondack area quilts. And she had another one of these. She showed no. a, polka, a polka dot quilt. Alden and I about fell out of our chairs. Like there's another one. Okay, so there's two more up there in Northern New York. How did they get up there? Yeah. And, and laying, and I can tell you after laying those, mo that mylar on and doing all the compar comparisons, they're so exact that it was one pattern that was being used from quilt to quilt. And they're laid out in exactly the same manner, the same motifs are in the same place. It's all alike, okay? So how to get up to Northern New York? Well, what else is in that county but Lyme, New York? And all of these quilts are associated with Lyme, Connecticut. They, uh, they, except for the, the American Folk Art Museum has lost its history, but all the other ones are connected to families in Lyme, Connecticut. And so these Connecticut families went up to Northern New York. They founded towns up there. One of them is named Lyme. Okay, Eber Kelsey, who is one of the founders of Lyme, New York. His, he and his wife are from Middlesex County, which is just across the river from New London County. His wife is from um, Saybrook, which is directly across the river from Lyme. So, and they move wow. up there in the late 18th century. So it's a great way of de um, demonstrating the continuation of relationships yeah. with um, their home community of, of Connecticut and such. So we have four of the quilts on display in the exhibition. This one's the American Folk Art. That one is yours, right? This one, this is, this is one of, just think about pulling this exhibition together. This is one of only two objects in this entire exhibit that belongs to the Florence Griswold Museum. Everything else is alone. Um, <laughs> okay, and then that one's the DAR. And then this one is the one at the Connecticut Historical Society. And this one, even though it's been to the conservator, she couldn't get the brown out. But this is the only one that has a brown backing. Uh, I think the, the dye migrated. All the other ones have white. Uh huh. And so there's just nothing to be done about it. But still, it's, a, it's an important quilt. And get this, these are quilted at 18 stitches to the inch. Good God. <laughs> Isn't that? Amazing. Yeah. Um, so okay. The, so, the thing is, though, if people want to see these all together, now's the chance. Yeah. Of, probably yeah. your only chance. Yeah. Your only chance. Well, May ever. 1. So you were asking about are these individual um, 
projects or what were their professionals? I think here's an indication of a professional working in Lyme around 1820 uh, because they're so consistent. The designs are the same. You can lay one mylar on top of the other and they practically match. It's just a matter of how much are they stuffed. You know, um, the stitch lengths are pretty much the same. Um, there's one that's a little bit shorter. I can't remember now which one it is. My, yeah, the, the DAR. So it could be that there was somebody who was marking quilts. Um, yeah. they, they were either making them or marking them for somebody else to make. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's another interesting tidbit about oh, I, I, county. I wish I could spend all day, every day, digging into these things. I do too. I wish oh. I could. <laughs> Wouldn't that um, be something? Okay, th this is the last, the last, yeah, group. Wow. This is um, just two pieces. But again, I consider these important. Um, because it shows a continuation within these new London County families of this needle tradition. Mm -hmm. This uh, white work, stuffed white work quilt was made by Lucy Foot, Foot, Bradford, Bradford. Okay, so these are names that we've already seen in this exhibition, the foot bed quilts, yeah. or I'm sorry, the, the foot bed rugs. And then the Bradford family were the ones who were creating those Montville appliques. Okay, so she is the she is the first cousin once removed of the bed rug makers, which sounds kind of distant, but these are small communities, and these people all knew each other. Um, I know my first cousin once removed. Right. Um, it's not that distant, really. And, yeah, um, and her husband was a nephew of the older Bradfords who made those appliques. So again, family connections here. Yeah. Um, but this is just an exquisite, this is at the Stanford Historical Society, an exquisite quilt with this wonderful design of a basket of flowers, a very, very typical um, early Republic design. Um, and you can see the feathered frame border in a, what is that, it's an octagon? No, yeah. one, two, three, four, five, tentagon, whatever that is. Um, and then great vines and flowers, etc. Okay, so then we come over here. It feels very Roman. Oh, yeah, definitely. Those basket of flowers and all yeah. that, and the yeah. great vines, everything. Yeah, okay, so here we have a quilt in the collection of the Met. It is the exact same design. Exactly. Except the grapevines are more square and that one they, they curve up, but you know, whoop de doo and, and this one has an additional border that mm -hmm. is missing from that one, otherwise, they're very alive. clearly related, very clearly right. related. Right, so here's the question. Um, this is Colchester. Was there another professional quilt marker at work in Colchester in the 1820s? Um, again, don't know the answer, but I, I just think it's a nice example of how the tradition, the heritage in this county continued into the 19th century of these exquisite needle arts um, as the, the forms, of the textile forms changed. And that is my exhibit. Thank you very much for coming. I'm so honored that you walked me through, walked us through this. Um, yeah, it, I, it's extraordinary. The work you've done that will, will benefit that region forever. I hope people will use it and, and um, you know, branch out and, and continue, continue the work. I mean, we all stand on the shoulders of the scholars before us. I'm grateful to Bill Warren. I am grateful to the collegiality of, of Linda Baumgarten and um, Jesse Marshall, you know, all these people who have, 
who have started this and I've been able to bring it together um, in this exhibition and then add to it. And then, you know, somebody, somebody else is gonna add to it, but I've got more to do. So yes, you um, do. before uh, we're, we're gonna do a book that uh, hopefully will be out next year. It's running through May 1st. May 1st. Right? May 1st. Yep. Thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate oh, thanks, you. Thanks, Tara. It's so nice to see you. You too. All right. We'll talk okay. soon. All right. <laughs>